Hello, I'm Professor Sue Jackson from Birkbeck University of London, where I'm a Professor of Lifelong Learning and Gender, Pro Vice Master for Learning and Teaching, and I also direct our Centre for Transformative Practice in Learning and Teaching. I'm delighted to be here with Professor Penny Jane Burke from Roehampton University in London and Professor Heidi Mirza from Goldsmiths University of London. I'm delighted to be with you both here at the European Conferences on Education and I just wanted to ask you to reflect um, one after the other on the conference theme of transforming and changing education, thinking about the borderlands of becoming and belonging. Well, at the moment, this is a hugely topical theme to be exploring as we are um, encountering a, a particular period in time where globalization, neoliberalism, and moves towards the marketization of higher education are predominating the ways in which we can imagine education and to have the spaces to explore possibilities for transformation to think through questions of borderlines and, and borders and boundaries in, in, in ways that people can be, become, um, think about their identities and the ways in which they engage with learning and pedagogy and education is particularly important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And for you, Heidi? Well, the idea of borderlands for me is really powerful because our institutions are borderlands, whether it's a secondary school, a primary school, a tertiary or a higher education institution, you have people coming from so many different backgrounds, um, you have different teaching styles, different subject matter, and they all collide in this space. And I think that's the borderland, and it's really hard to sometimes unpack what's going on in our institutions, because as Penny says, they're rapidly changing. We call it um, a, a sort of liquid organizations, mm. global, mm. borderless, edgeless places. And yet at the same time, they're also places where we see a lot of solidification of traditionalism, elitism, and privilege. Mm. So how do we negotiate those, those spaces in between in these borderlands? Um, and how do we transform our pedagogy so that everyone can feel included and and part of the educational process. Mm, thank you, I think that's absolutely true. And I know that you're interested in thinking about decolonizing pedagogies. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit about what that means for you, what you understand by that term. Some people think that maybe talking about colonization is something that uh, has been in the past. You know, we had the British Empire and other empires um, uh, across the, uh, the globe and that we are somehow in this very modern global age, but um, the colonization, as I was saying, of our institutions of particular kinds of knowledge and particular kinds of habitats or ways of being mm. is still very powerful. And in British institutions, for example, whiteness or the privileged group of people who tend to be white, who are male, dominate those institutions. And my question is, what is it like as a woman of color being in those institutions? They are difficult places to be. And you have to decolonize yourself in order to um, negotiate that space and survive it. Because being a survivor in places where you feel like a fish out of water or it isn't your natural mm -hmm. habitat is a very difficult place to negotiate every day when trying to succeed in a career in higher education. And all of that can be a very painful, difficult journey. And I think that makes it quite difficult for us to think about the ways in which pedagogies might transform and change. So Penny, in thinking about transformative pedagogies, how far is it possible to really be transformative through a pedagogic process? Well, I do think this raises some really serious challenges when we're thinking about how we can open up spaces that are able to address the complexity of histories of exclusion and inequality in institutions like higher education, and also to, um, to find spaces which are in, in many ways being closed down in terms of the um, 
age of austerity, the cutbacks, um, the lack of resources, um, the kinds of intensification of workloads in which academics and what it means to be an academic are juggling a range of different expectations, demands on their time, and are also caught up in a position where they must prove themselves through various kinds of performances of the self, um, which are measured against um, quite empty kinds of ways of understanding excellence in my view. So we have a discourse of excellence around research and teaching, but we don't really know what that means. And often what it means is um, a standardization of particular measurements of excellence. And so the ways in which we can think about our teaching become very reductive because we're caught up in um, institutions which are concerned about league, table, league tables, league table cultures, um, student surveys, student evaluations, and the nature of those kinds of measurements themselves are highly reductive. Mm -hmm. So the ways in which a student might evaluate a course um, is, is limited by the, the kinds of mechanisms that are available in order to um, make sense of what is excellent. Um, and, and also, um, students then are, uh, or, or the encouragement is for um, kind of very low risk approaches to teaching because lectures will be concerned that students want to give a, you know, they want students to give a very good evaluation of their course. Um, and that actually narrows the ways that mm. we might be creative. On the other hand, I think that there are possibilities for us to engage mm -hmm. questions of transformation through um, uh, more critical theoretical approaches that help us to think about questions of difference and help us to engage those differences in creative ways that draw on um, the experiences, the backgrounds, the histories, and the understandings of students from um, historically marginalized groups. And it's, is it thinking about some of that creativity that keeps you passionate about your work, that keeps you going in some of those darker times? It, it absolutely is. I, that, is that, that is what keeps me going. I think um, working with students is one of the most fulfilling and rewarding um, experiences that you can have. And finding those spaces together um, where you can bring to life um, meaning and knowledge and understanding and make connections between that and people's own experiences mm -hmm. is an extremely exciting process. Um, and so although it's full of these challenges I've just outlined, mm -hmm. um, I think that those are the ways in which we can energize ourselves um, and find ways together, collaboratively and collectively, to do things in different ways and to work closely with our students to um, develop those, those different kinds of approaches. Thank you. And Heidi, where are your passions and energies? Where do you find well, them? I'm passionate um, about human rights mm. and achieving mm. equity in education through, um, through transformative pedagogy. And by transformative pedagogy, it's actually about being reflexive so that tutors, lecturers, think about their own practice in relation to the students that they teach. And until we do that, I don't think that we will have the kind of change that we want, the grassroots change mm. in our institutions. But it's about respecting difference, and I'm passionate yeah. about that. So lots of challenges there for all of us. Thank you. I'd like to thank Professor Penny Jane Burke, who is Professor of Education and Director of the Paolo Ferreira Institute at Roehampton, for those words here today, and also Professor Heidi Merza, who's Professor of Race, Faith and Culture at Goldsmiths. Thank you too for you for listening. Thank you. <laughs>